18 million visitors headed to Brisbane's Expo 88 to experience the world's best new ideas, which included a monorail and a large echidna. Our national pride was at an all-time high, but it was 21 years before when Australia first made a lasting impact at a world fair. The following story told by me, Tim Ross, is from the collection of the National Archives of Australia. 1967. Harold Holt was Prime Minister, Holden debuted the Tirana, and Australia's first skyscraper, Australia Square, was completed in Sydney. Optimism was high and we were looking to the future. Driven by Melbourne architect Robin Boyd, the world was about to truly experience modern Australian design. Last time we'd exhibited at a World Fair was in 1939 and we were shoved out the back of the British Pavilion. So this time round, we had something to prove. The pavilion, designed by James McCormick, had natural light streaming through the north and south sloping glass sides. Internally, large wood-ribbed curved Tasmanian blackwood tree-like pillars dominated the space. Australian wool was everywhere, on the floor and the walls and in the bright orange uniforms worn by the hostesses. They were designed by Harold Holt's wife Zara and her partner Betty Grounds. The 21 hostesses, led by former Miss Australia Rosemary Fenton, guided a thousand visitors per hour around the pavilion. <laughs> Modernity was on display with large-scale models of the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme and the park's radio telescope. There was a replica of Canberra as a model city and Gordon Andrews' designs for Australian currency. Just gone decimal in 1966. The highlight, though, were the talking chairs. Robin Boyd had commissioned designers Grant and Mary Featherson to design the high-backed wing chair. The brief was this. They had to handle 20,000 people sitting on them during the exhibition, and they had to talk. Shells were moulded in expanded rigid polystyrene, and stereophonic speakers were added to the chair's headrests. They certainly showed off our designing and manufacturing chops. Out of the speakers, visitors could hear stories about the Australian way of life. The commentaries were available in French and English. One would need to just choose their colour. An orange cushion for French and a dark green one for English. When your bottom hit the cushion, it set off a tape player embedded in the seat. The chairs were placed in an informal arrangement accompanied by occasional tables with piles of books on Australian society and even ashtrays to evoke the ease of Australian life. Boyd saw to it that everything had to be Australian, down to the dinner service and cutlery in the pavilion's private banquet room. Well, so what did the world think of our pavilion? One Canadian journalist summed it up like this. A miracle of good taste. One comes gratefully to the Aussie's great room with its restful lamb's wool carpet and sits down in one of the deep green chairs. They begin to talk, but it's a subdued message, a very soft sell, all very soothing on an otherwise busy day. Back at home, live coverage was beamed for the very first time via satellite into our homes for Australia's National Day. Amongst performances by the Seekers and Normie Row, we saw how others saw our modern design. We were impressed and proud. There's no doubt that Expo 67 made a significant impact on the world stage. It helped construct an image of Australia as a forward-thinking and culturally sophisticated nation. And it helped to solidify design as part of our national identity. 